Worms of the Earth by Robert E. Howard Chapter 1 Strike in the nails, soldiers, and let our guests see the reality of our good Roman justice. The speaker wrapped his purple cloak closer about his powerful frame and settled back into his official chair, much as he might have settled back in his seat at the Circus Maximus to enjoy the clash of gladiatorial swords. Realization of power colored his every move. Wetted pride was necessary to Roman satisfaction, and Titus Sulla was justly proud, for he was military governor of Eboracum and answerable only to the emperor of Rome. He was a strongly built man of medium height, with the hawk-like features of the purebred Roman. Now a mocking smile curved his full lips, increasing the arrogance of his haughty aspect. Distinctly military in appearance, he wore the golden scaled corselet and chased breastplate of his rank, with a short stabbing sword at his belt, and he held on his knee the silvered helmet with its plumed crest. Behind him stood a clump of impassive soldiers with shield and spear, blonde titans from the Rhineland. Before him was taking place the scene which apparently gave him so much real gratification. A scene common enough wherever stretched the far-flung boundaries of Rome. A rude cross lay flat upon the barren earth, and on it was bound a man half-naked, wild of aspect with his corded limbs, glaring eyes and shock of tangled hair. His executioners were Roman soldiers, and with heavy hammers they prepared to pin the victim's hands and feet to the wood with iron spikes. Only a small group of men watched this ghastly scene in the dread place of execution beyond the city walls. The governor and his watchful guards, a few young Roman officers, the man to whom Sulla had referred as guest, and who stood like a bronze image unspeaking. Beside the gleaming splendor of the Roman, the quiet garb of this man seemed drab, almost somber. He was dark, but he did not resemble the Latins around him. There was about him none of the warm, almost oriental sensuality of the Mediterranean, which colored their features. The blonde barbarians behind Sulla's chair were less unlike the man in facial outline than were the Romans. Not his were the full curving red lips, nor the rich waving locks suggestive of the Greek. Nor was his dark complexion the rich olive of the south. Rather, it was the bleak darkness of the north. The whole aspect of the man vaguely suggested the shadowed mists, the gloom, the cold, and the icy winds of the naked northern lands. Even his black eyes were savagely cold, like black fires burning through fathoms of ice. His height was only medium, but there was something about him which transcended mere physical bulk, a certain fierce innate vitality, comparable only to that of a wolf or a panther. In every line of his supple, compact body, as well as in his coarse, straight hair and thin lips, this was evident in the hawk-like set of the head on the corded neck, in the broad square shoulders, in the deep chest, the lean loins, the narrow feet. Built with a savage economy of a panther, he was an image of dynamic potentialities, pent in with iron self-control. At his feet crouched one like him in complexion, but there the resemblance ended. This other was a stunted giant with gnarly limbs, thick body, a low sloping brow and an expression of dull ferocity now clearly mixed with fear. If the man on the cross resembled in a tribal way, the man Tita Sula called Guest, he far more resembled the stunted, crouching giant. Well, Partha Makothna, said the governor with studied effrontery, when you return to your tribe, you will have a tale to tell of the justice of Rome, who rules the south. I will have a tale, answered the other in a voice, which betrayed no emotion, just as his dark face, schooled to immobility, showed no evidence of the maelstrom in his soul. Justice to all under the rule of Rome, said Sulla. Pax Romana, reward for virtue, punishment for wrong. He laughed inwardly at his own black hypocrisy, then continued. You see, emissary of Pictland, how swiftly Rome punishes the transgressor. I see, answered the Pict in a voice which strongly curbed anger made deep with menace, that the subject of a foreign king is dealt with, as though he were a Roman slave. He has been tried and condemned in an unbiased court, retorted Sulla. Aye, and the accuser was a Roman, the witness is Roman, the judge Roman. He committed murder. In a moment of fury, he struck down a Roman merchant who cheated, tricked and robbed him, and to injury added insult. Aye, and a blow is his king, but a dog that Rome crucifies his subjects at will, condemned by Roman courts. Is his king too weak or foolish to do justice? 
were he informed and formal charges brought against the offender. Well, said Sula cynically, you may inform Bran Macmorn yourself. Rome, my friend, makes no account of her actions to barbarian kings. When savages come among us, let them act with discretion or suffer the consequences. The Pict shut his iron jaws with a snap that told Sula further badgering would elicit no reply. The Roman made a gesture to the executioners. One of them seized a spike and placing it against the thick wrist of the victim, smote heavily. The iron point sank deep through the flesh, crunching against the bones. The lips of the man on the cross writhed, though no moan escaped him. As a trapped wolf fights against his cage, the bound victim instinctively wrenched and struggled. The veins swelled in his temples, sweat beaded his low forehead, the muscles in arms and legs writhed and knotted. The hammers fell in inexorable strokes, driving the cruel points deeper and deeper through wrists and ankles. Blood flowed in a black river over the hands that held the spikes, staining the wood of the cross, and the splintering of bones was distinctly heard. Yet the sufferer made no outcry, though his blackened lips writhed back until the gums were visible, and his shaggy head jerked involuntarily from side to side. The man called Partha Macothna stood like an iron image, eyes burning from an inscrutable face, his whole body hard as iron from the tension of his control. At his feet crouched his misshapen servant, hiding his face from the grim sight, his arms locked about his master's knees. Those arms gripped like steel, and under his breath, the fellow mumbled ceaselessly as if in invocation. The last stroke fell. The cords were cut from arm and leg, so that the man would hang supported by the nails alone. He had ceased his struggling, but only twisted the spikes in his agonizing wounds. His bright black eyes, unglazed, had not left the face of the man called Partha Macothna. In them lingered a desperate shadow of hope. Now the soldiers lifted the cross and set the end of it in the hole prepared, stamped the dirt about it to hold it erect. The Pict hung in midair, suspended by the nails in his flesh, but still no sound escaped his lips. His eyes still hung on the somber face of the emissary, but the shadow of hope was fading. He'll live for days, said Sula cheerfully. These Picts are harder than cats to kill. I'll keep a guard of ten soldiers watching night and day to see that no one takes him down before he dies. Ho oh, there, Valerius, in honor of our esteemed neighbor, King Bran Macmorn, give him a cup of wine. With a laugh, the young officer came forward, holding a brimming wine cup, and rising on his toes, lifted it to the parched lips of the sufferer. In the black eyes flared a red wave of unquenchable hatred. Writhing his head aside to avoid even touching the cup, he spat full into the young Roman's eyes. With a curse, Valerius dashed the cup to the ground, and before any could halt him, wrenched out his sword and sheathed it in the man's body. Sula rose with an imperious exclamation of anger. The man called Partha Macothna had started violently, but he bit his lip and said nothing. Valerius seemed somewhat surprised at him as he sullenly cleansed his sword. The act had been instinctive, following the insult to Roman pride, the one thing unbearable. Give up your sword, young sir, exclaimed Sula. Centurion Publius, place him under arrest. A few days in a cell with stale bread and water will teach you to curb your patrician pride in matters dealing with the will of the empire. What, you young fool? Do you not realize that you could not have made the dog a more kindly gift? Who would not rather desire a quick death on the sword than the slow agony on the cross? Take him away. And you, Centurion, see that guards remain at the cross so that the body is not cut down until the ravens pick bare the bones. Partha Macothna, I go to a banquet at the house of Demetrius. Will you not accompany me? The emissary shook his head, his eyes fixed on the limp form which sagged on the black-stained cross. He made no reply. Sula smiled sardonically, then rose and strode away, followed by his secretary who bore the gilded chair ceremoniously and by the stolid soldiers with whom walked Valerius, head sunken. The man called Partha Macothna flung a wide fold of his cloak about his shoulder, halted a moment to gaze at the grim cross with its burden, darkly etched against the crimson sky, where the clouds of night were gathering. Then he stalked away, followed by his silent servant. Chapter 2 In an inner chamber of Eberacum, the man called Partha Macothna paced tigerishly to and fro. His sandaled feet made no sound on the marble tiles. 
Crom, he turned to the gnarled servant. Well, I know why you held my knees so tightly, why you muttered aid of the Moon Woman. You feared I would lose my self-control and make a mad attempt to succor that poor wretch. By the gods, I believe that was what the dog Roman wished. His iron-cased watchdogs watched me narrowly, I know, and his baiting was harder to bear than ordinarily. Gods black and white, dark and light. He shook his clenched fists above his head in the black gust of his passion. That I should stand by and see a man of mine butchered on a Roman cross. Without justice and with no more trial than that farce. Black gods of Arlie, even you would I invoke to the ruin and destruction of those butchers. I swear by the nameless ones, men shall die howling for that deed, and Rome shall cry out as a woman in the dark who treads upon an adder. He knew you, master, said Grom. The other dropped his head and covered his eyes with a gesture of savage pain. His eyes will haunt me when I lie dying. Aye, he knew me, and almost until the last, I read in his eyes the hope that I might aid him. Gods and devils, is Rome to butcher my people beneath my very eyes. Then I am not king but dog. Not so loud, in the name of all the gods, exclaimed Grom in a fright. Did these Romans suspect you were Bran Mac Morn? They would nail you on a cross beside that other. They will know it ere long, grimly answered the king. Too long I have lingered here in the guise of an emissary, spying upon mine enemies. They have thought to play with me, these Romans, masking their contempt and scorn only under polished satire. Rome is courteous to barbarian ambassadors. They give us fine houses to live in, offer us slaves, pander to our lusts with women and gold and wine and games, but all the while they laugh at us. Their very courtesy is an insult, and sometimes as today, their contempt discards all veneer. Bah! I've seen through their baitings, have remained imperturbably serene and swallowed their studied insults. But this, by the fiends of hell, this is beyond human endurance. My people look to me. If I fail them, if I fail even one, even the lowest of my people, who will aid them? To whom shall they turn? By the gods, I'll answer the jibes of these Roman dogs, with black shaft and trenchant steel. And the chief with the plumes, Grom meant the governor, and his gutturals thrummed with the blood lust. He dies. He flicked out a length of steel. Bran scowled. Easier said than done. He dies. But how may I reach him? By day his German guards keep at his back. By night they stand at door and window. He has many enemies, Romans as well as barbarians. Many a Briton would gladly slit his throat. Grom seized Bran's garment, stammering as fierce eagerness, broke the bonds of his inarticulate nature. Let me go, master. My life is worth nothing. I will cut him down in the midst of his warriors. Bran smiled fiercely and clapped his hand on the stunted giant's shoulder with a force that would have felled a lesser man. Nay, old war dog, I have too much need of thee. You shall not throw your life away uselessly. Sula would read the intent in your eyes besides, and the javelins of his Teutons would be through you ere you could reach him. Not by the dagger in the dark will we strike this Roman, not by the venom in the cup, nor the shaft from the ambush. The king turned and paced the floor a moment, his head bent in thought. Slowly his eyes grew murky with a thought so fearful, he did not speak it aloud to the waiting warrior. I have become somewhat familiar with the maze of Roman politics during my stay in this accursed waste of mud and marble, said he. During a war on the wall, Titus Sula, as governor of this province, is supposed to hasten thither with his centuries. But this Sula does not do. He is no coward, but the bravest avoids certain things. To each man, however bold, his own particular fear. So he sends in his place Caius Camillus, who in times of peace patrols the fens of the west, lest the Britons break over the border. And Sula takes his place in the Tower of Trajan. Ha! He whirled and gripped Grom with steely fingers. Grom, take the red stallion and ride north. Let no grass grow under the stallion's hoofs. Ride to Cormac Narconact and tell him to sweep the frontier with sword and torch. Let his wild gales feast their fill of slaughter. After a time I will be with him, but for a time I have affairs in the west. Grom's black eyes gleamed and he made a passionate gesture with his crooked hand. An instinctive move of savagery. Bran drew a heavy bronze seal from beneath his tunic. This is my safe conduct as an emissary to Roman courts, he said grimly. 
It will open all gates between this house and Baldor. If any official questions you too closely here. Lifting the lid of an iron-bound chest, Bran took out a small, heavy leather bag, which he gave into the hands of the warrior. When all keys fail at a gate, said he, try a golden key. Go now. There were no ceremonious farewells between the barbarian king and his barbarian vassal. Grom flung up his arm in a gesture of salute. Then turning, he hurried out. Bran stepped to a barred window and gazed out into the moonlit streets. Wait until the moon sets, he muttered grimly. Then I'll take the road to hell. But before I go, I have a debt to pay. The stealthy clink of a hoof on the flags reached him. With a safe conduct and gold, not even Rome can hold a Pictish reaver, muttered the king. Now I'll sleep until the moon sets. With a snarl at the marble frieze work and fluted columns as symbols of Rome, he flung himself down on a couch from which he had long since impatiently torn the cushions and silk stuffs as too soft for his hard body. Hate and the black passion of vengeance seethed in him, yet he went instantly to sleep. The first lesson he had learned in his bitter hard life was to snatch sleep any time he could, like a wolf that snatches sleep on the hunting trail. Generally his slumber was as light and dreamless as a panther's, but tonight it was otherwise. He sank into fleecy grey fathoms of slumber, and in a timeless misty realm of shadows, he met the tall lean white bearded figure of old Gonar, the priest of the moon, high counsellor to the king. And Bran stood aghast, for Gonar's face was white as driven snow, and he shook as with ague. Well might Bran stand appalled, for in all the years of his life, he had never before seen Gunnar the Wise show any sign of fear. What now, old one? asked the king. Goes all well in Baldor. All is well in Baldor where my body lies sleeping, answered old Gunnar. Across the void I have come to battle with you for your soul. King, are you mad? This thought you have thought in your brain. Gunnar, answered Bran somberly. This day I stood still and watched a man of mine die on the cross of Rome. What his name or his rank? I do not know. I do not care. He might have been a faithful unknown warrior of mine. He might have been an outlaw. I only know that he was mine. The first sense he knew were the sense of the heather. The first light he saw was the sunrise on the Pictish hills. He belonged to me, not to Rome. If punishment was just, then none but me should have dealt it. If he were to be tried, none but me should have been his judge. The same blood flowed in our veins. The same fire maddened our brains. In infancy we listened to the same old tales, and in youth we sang the same old songs. He was bound to my heartstrings, as every man and every woman and every child of Pictland is bound. It was mine to protect him, now it is mine to avenge him. But in the name of the gods, Bran, expostulated the wizard, take your vengeance in another way, return to the heather. Mass your warriors, join with Cormac and his gales, and spread a sea of blood and flame the length of the Great Wall. All that I will do, grimly answered Bran. But now, now, I will have a vengeance such as no Roman ever dreamed of. Ha! What do they know of the mysteries of this ancient isle, which sheltered strange life long before Rome rose from the marshes of the Tiber? Bran, there are weapons too foul to use, even against Rome. Bran barked short and sharp as a jackal. Ha! There are no weapons I would not use against Rome. My back is at the wall. By the blood of the fiends has Rome fought me fair. Bah! I am a barbarian king with a wolfskin mantle and an iron crown, fighting with my handful of bows and broken pikes against the queen of the world. What have I? The heather hills, the wattle huts, the spears of my shock-headed tribesmen, and I fight Rome. With her armoured legions, her broad fertile plains and rich seas, her mountains and her rivers and her gleaming citizenship wealth, her steel, her gold, her mastery and her wrath. By steel and fire I will fight her, and by subtlety and treachery. By the thorn in the foot, the adder in the path, the venom in the cup, the dagger in the dark, I, his voice sank somberly, and by the worms of the earth. But it is madness, cried Gunnar. You will perish in the attempt you plan, you will go down to hell, and you will not return. What of your people then? If I cannot serve them, I had better die, growled the king. But you cannot even reach the beings you seek, cried Gunnar. For untold centuries they have dwelt apart. There is no door by which you can come to them. 
Long ago, they severed the bonds that bound them to the world we know. Long ago, answered Bran somberly, you told me that nothing in the universe was separated from the stream of life, a saying the truth of which I have often seen evident. No race, no form of life, but is close-knit somehow, by some manner, to the rest of life and the world. Somewhere there is a thin link connecting those I seek to the world I know. Somewhere there is a door, and somewhere among the bleak fens of the west I will find it. Stark horror flooded Gunnar's eyes, and he gave back, crying, Woe! 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 To Pictum! Woe to the unborn kingdom! Woe! Black woe to the sons of men! Woe! 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 Bran awoke to a shadowed room and the starlight on the window bars. The moon had sunk from sight, though its glow was still faint above the house tops. Memory of his dream shook him, and he swore beneath his breath. Rising, he flung off cloak and mantle, donning a light shirt of black mesh mail, and girding on sword and dirk. Going again to the iron-bound chest, he lifted several compact bags and emptied the clinking contents into the leathern pouch at his girdle. Then wrapping his wide cloak about him, he silently left the house. No servants there were to spy on him. He had impatiently refused the offer of slaves, which it was Rome's policy to furnish her barbarian emissaries. Gnarled Grom had attended to all Bran's simple needs. The stables fronted on the courtyard. A moment's groping in the dark, and he placed his hand over a great stallion's nose, checking the nicker of recognition. Working without a light, he swiftly bridled and saddled the great brute, and went through the courtyard into a shadowy side street, leading him. The moon was setting, the border of floating shadows widening along the western wall. Silence lay on the marble palaces and mud hovels of Eberacham under the cold stars. Bran touched the pouch at his girdle, which was heavy with minted gold that bore the stamp of Rome. He had come to Eberacham posing as an emissary of Pictum to act the spy. But being a barbarian, he had not been able to play his part in aloof formality and sedate dignity. He retained a crowded memory of wild feasts where wine flowed in fountains, of white-bosomed Roman women who, sated with civilized lovers, looked with something more than favor on a virile barbarian, of gladiatorial games and of other games where dice clicked and spun and tall stacks of gold changed hands. He had drunk deeply and gambled recklessly after the manner of barbarians and he had had a remarkable run of luck due possibly to the indifference with which he won or lost. Gold to the Pict was so much dust flowing through his fingers. In his land there was no need of it, but he had learned its power in the boundaries of civilization. Almost under the shadow of the northwestern wall, he saw ahead of him loom the great watchtower which was connected with and reared above the outer wall. One corner of the castle-like fortress, farthest from the wall, served as a dungeon. Bran left his horse standing in a dark alley, with the reins hanging on the ground, and stole like a prowling wolf into the shadows of the fortress. The young officer Valerius was awakened from a light, unquiet sleep by a stealthy sound at the barred window. He sat up, cursing softly under his breath as the faint starlight which etched the window bars fell across the bare stone floor and reminded him of his disgrace. Well, in a few days, he ruminated, he'd be well out of it. Sula would not be too harsh on a man with such high connections. Then let any man or woman jibe at him. Damn that insolent Pict. But wait, he thought suddenly, remembering. What of the sound which had roused him? Ushed! It was a voice from the window. Why so much secrecy? It could hardly be a foe. Yet, why should it be a friend? Valerius rose and crossed his cell, coming close to the window. Outside all was dim in the starlight, and he made out but a shadowy form close to the window. Who are you? He leaned close against the bars, straining his eyes into the gloom. His answer was a snarl of wolfish laughter, a long flicker of steel in the starlight. Valerius reeled away from the window and crashed to the floor, clutching his throat, gurgling horribly as he tried to scream. Blood gushed through his fingers, forming about his twitching body a pool that reflected the dim starlight dully and redly. Outside, Bran glided away like a shadow, without pausing to peer into the cell. In another minute, the guards would round the corner on their regular routine. Even now, he heard the measured tramp of their iron-clad feet. Before they came in sight, he had vanished, and they clumped stolidly by the cell window, with no intimation of the corpse 
that lay on the floor within. Bran rode to the small gate in the western wall, unchallenged by the sleepy watch. What fear of foreign invasion in Eberacum? And certain well-organized thieves and women stealers made it profitable for the watchman not to be too vigilant. But the single guardsman at the western gate, his fellows lay drunk in a nearby brothel, lifted his spear and bawled for Bran to halt and give an account of himself. Silently, the Pict reigned closer. Masked in the dark cloak, he seemed dim and indistinct to the Roman, who was only aware of the glitter of his cold eyes in the gloom. But Bran held up his hand against the starlight, and the soldier caught the gleam of gold. In the other hand, he saw a long sheen of steel. The soldier understood, and he did not hesitate between the choice of a golden bribe or a battle to the death with this unknown rider, who was apparently a barbarian of some sort. With a grunt, he lowered his spear and swung the gate open. Bran rode through, casting a handful of coins to the Roman. They fell about his feet in a golden shower, clinking against the flags. He bent in greedy haste to retrieve them, and Bran Mac Morn rode westward like a flying ghost in the night. Chapter 3 Into the dim fens of the west came Bran Mac Morn. A cold wind breathed across the gloomy waste and against the grey sky. A few herons flapped heavily. The long reeds and marsh grass waved in broken undulations, and out across the desolation of the wastes, a few still mirrors reflected the dull light. Here and there rose curiously regular hillocks above the general levels, and gaunt against the somber sky, Bran saw a marching line of upright monoliths, menhirs, reared by what nameless hands. A faint blue line to the west lay the foothills, that beyond the horizon grew to the wild mountains of Wales, where dwelt still wild Celtic tribes' fierce blue-eyed men that knew not the yoke of Rome. A row of well-garrisoned watchtowers held them in check. Even now, far away across the moors, Bran glimpsed the unassailable keep, men called the Tower of Trajan. These barren wastes seemed the dreary accomplishment of desolation, yet human life was not utterly lacking. Bran met the silent men of the Fen, reticent dark of eye and hair, speaking a strange mixed tongue, whose long-blended elements had forgotten their pristine separate sources. Bran recognized a certain kinship in these people to himself, but he looked on them with the scorn of a pure-blooded patrician for men of mixed strains. Not that the common people of Caledonia were altogether pure-blooded. They got their stocky bodies and massive limbs from a primitive Teutonic race, which had found its way into the northern tip of the isle even before the Celtic conquest of Britain was completed and had been absorbed by the Picts. But the chiefs of Bran's folk had kept their blood from foreign taint since the beginnings of time, and he himself was a purebred Pict of the old race. But these Fenmen, overrun repeatedly by British, Gaelic and Roman conquerors, had assimilated blood of each and in the process almost forgotten their original language and lineage. For Bran came of a race that was very old, which had spread over Western Europe in one vast dark empire before the coming of the Aryans, when the ancestors of the Celts, the Hellenes and the Germans were one primal people, before the days of tribal splitting off and westward drift. Only in Caledonia, Bran brooded, had his people resisted the flood of Aryan conquest. He had heard of a Pictish people called Basques, who in the crags of the Pyrenees called themselves an unconquered race but he knew that they had paid tribute for centuries to the ancestors of the Gaels before these Celtic conquerors abandoned their mountain realm and set sail for Ireland. Only the Picts of Caledonia had remained free, and they had been scattered into small feuding tribes. He was the first acknowledged king in 500 years. The beginning of a new dynasty, no, a revival of an ancient dynasty under a new name. In the very teeth of Rome he dreamed his dreams of empire. He wandered through the fens, seeking a door. Of his quest, he said nothing to the dark-eyed fenmen. They told him news that drifted from mouth to mouth, a tale of war in the north, the skirl of war pipes along the winding wall, of gathering fires in the heather, of flame and smoke and rapine, and the glutting of Gaelic swords in the crimson sea of slaughter. The eagles of the legions were moving northward, and the ancient road resounded to the measured tramp of the iron-clad feet and Bran, in the fens of the west, laughed well pleased. In Eberacum, Titus Sula gave secret word to seek out the Pictish emissary with a Gaelic name, who had been under suspicion and who had vanished 
the night young Valerius was found dead in his cell, with his throat ripped out. Sulla felt that this sudden bursting flame of war on the wall was connected closely with his execution of a condemned Pictish criminal, and he set his spy system to work, though he felt sure that Partha Makothna was by this time far beyond his reach. He prepared to march from Eberacum, but he did not accompany the considerable force of legionaries, which he sent north. Sulla was a brave man, but each man has his own dread, and Sulla's was Cormac Nakanakt, the black-haired prince of the Gaels, who had sworn to cut out the governor's heart and eat it raw. So Sulla rode with his ever-present bodyguard westward, where lay the Tower of Trajan with its warlike commander, Caius Camillus, who enjoyed nothing more than taking his superior's place when the red waves of war washed at the foot of the wall. Devious politics, but the legate of Rome seldom visited this far isle, and what of his wealth and intrigues, Titus Sulla was the highest power in Britain. And Bran, knowing all this, patiently waited his coming in the deserted hut in which he had taken up his abode. One grey evening, he strode on foot across the moors, a stark figure blackly etched against the dim crimson fire of the sunset. He felt the incredible antiquity of the slumbering land as he walked like the last man on the day after the end of the world, yet at last he saw a token of human life. A drab hut of wattle and mud set in the reedy breast of the fen. A woman greeted him from the open door, and Bran's sombre eyes narrowed with a dark suspicion. The woman was not old, yet the evil wisdom of ages was in her eyes. Her garments were ragged and scanty, her black locks tangled and unkempt, lending her an aspect of wildness, well in keeping with her grim surroundings. Her red lips laughed, but there was no mirth in her laughter, only a hint of mockery, and under the lips, her teeth showed sharp and pointed like fangs. Enter, master, said she, if you do not fear to share the roof of the witch woman of Dagon Moor. Bran entered silently and sat him down on a broken bench, while the woman busied herself with a scanty meal, cooking over an open fire on the squalid hearth. He studied her life, almost serpentine motions, the ears which were almost pointed, the yellow eyes which slanted curiously. What do you seek in the fens, my lord? she asked, turning toward him with a supple twist of her whole body. I seek a door, he answered, chin resting on his fist. I have a song to sing to the worms of the earth. She started upright, a jar falling from her hands to shatter on the hearth. This is an ill saying, even spoken in chance, she stammered. I speak not by chance, but by intent, he answered. She shook her head. I know not what you mean. Well, you know, he returned. I, you know well. My race is very old. They reigned in Britain before the nations of the Celts and the Hellenes were born out of the womb of peoples. But my people were not first in Britain. By the mottles on your skin, by the slanting of your eyes, by the taint in your veins, I speak with full knowledge and meaning. A while she stood silent, her lips smiling but her face inscrutable. Man, are you mad? she asked. That in your madness you come seeking that from which strong men fled screaming in old times. I seek a vengeance, he answered. That can be accomplished only by them I seek. She shook her head. You have listened to a bird singing. You have dreamed empty dreams. I have heard a viper hiss, he growled, and I do not dream. Enough of this weaving of words. I came seeking a link between two worlds. I have found it. I need lie to you no more, man of the north, answered the woman. They you seek still dwell beneath the sleeping hills. They have drawn apart, farther and farther from the world, you know. But they still steal forth in the night, to grip women straying on the moors, said he, his gaze on her slanted eyes. She laughed wickedly. What would you of me? That you bring me to them? She flung back her head with a scornful laugh. His left hand locked like iron in the breast of her scanty garment, and his right closed on his hilt. She laughed in his face. Strike and be damned, my northern wolf! Do you think that such life as mine is so sweet that I would cling to it as a babe to the breast? His hand fell away. You are right. Threats are foolish. I will buy your aid. How? The laughing voice hummed with mockery. Bran opened his pouch and poured into his cupped palm a stream of gold, more wealth than the men of the Fen ever dreamed of. Again she laughed. What is this rusty metal to me? 
Save it for some white-breasted Roman woman who will play the traitor for you. Name me a price, he urged, the head of an enemy. By the blood in my veins, with its heritage of ancient hate, who is mine enemy but thee? She laughed and springing, struck cat-like, but her dagger splintered on the mail beneath his cloak, and he flung her off with a loathsome flit of his wrist, which tossed her sprawling across her grass-strewn bunk. Lying there, she laughed up at him. I will name you a price then, my wolf, and it may be in days to come you will curse the armour that broke Atlas' dagger. She rose and came close to him, her disquietingly long hands fastened fiercely into his cloak. I will tell you, Black Bran, King of Caledon. Oh, I knew you, when you came into my hut, with your black hair and your cold eyes. I will lead you to the doors of hell, if you wish. And the price shall be the kisses of a king. What of my blasted and bitter life, I whom mortal men loathe and fear? I have not known the love of men, the clasp of a strong arm, the sting of human kisses, I Atla, the were woman of the moors. What have I known but the lone winds of the fens, the dreary fire of cold sunsets, the whispering of the marsh grasses, the faces that blink up at me in the waters of the meres, the footpad of night, things in the gloom, the glimmer of red eyes, the grisly murmur of nameless beings in the night. I am half human at least. Have I not known sorrow and yearning and crying wistfulness and the drear ache of loneliness? Give to me, King, give me your fierce kisses and your hurtful barbarian's embrace. Then, in the long drear years to come, I shall not utterly eat out my heart in vain, envy of the white-bosomed women of men. For I shall have a memory, few of them can bow us, the kisses of a king. One night of love, O king, and I will guide you to the gates of hell. Bran eyed her somnily. He reached forth and gripped her arm in his iron fingers. An involuntary shudder shook him at the feel of her sleek skin. He nodded slowly and drawing her close to him, forced his head down to meet her lifted lips. Chapter 4 The cold grey mists of dawn wrapped King Bran like a clammy cloak. He turned to the woman whose slanted eyes gleamed in the grey gloom. Make good your part of the contract, he said roughly. I sought a link between worlds, and in you I found it. I seek the one thing sacred to them. It shall be the key, opening the door that lies unseen between me and them. Tell me how I can reach it. I will, the red lips smiled terribly. Go to the mound men called Dagon's Barrow. Draw aside the stone that blocks the entrance and go under the dome of the mound. The floor of the chamber is made of seven great stones, six grouped about the seventh. Lift out the center stone and you will see. Will I find the black stone, he asked. Dagon's Barrow is the door to the black stone, she answered, if you dare follow the road. Will the symbol be well guarded he unconsciously loosened his blade in its sheath. The red lips curled mockingly. If you meet any on the road, you will die as no mortal man has died for long centuries. The stone is not guarded as men guard their treasures. Why should they guard what man has never sought? Perhaps they will be near, perhaps not. It is a chance you must take if you wish the stone. Beware, King of Pictum. Remember it was your folk who so long ago cut the thread that bound them to human life. They were almost human then. They overspread the land and knew the sunlight. Now they have drawn apart. They know not the sunlight and they shun the light of the moon. Even the starlight they hate. Far, far apart have they drawn, who might have been men in time, but for the spears of your ancestors. The sky was overcast with misty grey, through which the sun shone coldly yellow when Bran came to Dagon's Barrow a round hillock overgrown with rank grass of a curious fungoid appearance. On the eastern side of the mound showed the entrance of a crudely built stone tunnel, which evidently penetrated the barrow. One great stone blocked the entrance to the tomb. Bran laid hold of the sharp edges and exerted all his strength. It held fast. He drew his sword and worked the blade between the blocking stone and the sill. Using the sword as a lever, he worked carefully and managed to loosen the great stone and wrench it out. A foul charnel house scent flowed out of the aperture, and the dim sunlight seemed less to illuminate the cavern-like opening than to be fouled by the rank darkness which clung there. Sword in hand, ready for he knew not what, Bran groped his way into the tunnel, which was long and narrow, built up of heavy joined stones, and was too low for him to stand erect. 
Either his eyes became somewhat accustomed to the gloom, or the darkness was, after all, somewhat lightened by the sunlight, filtering in through the entrance. At any rate, he came into a round low chamber and was able to make out its general dome-like outline. Here, no doubt in old times, had reposed the bones of him, for whom the stones of the tomb had been joined and the earth heaped high above them. But now of those bones, no vestige remained on the stone floor. And bending close and straining his eyes, Bran made out the strange, startlingly regular pattern of that floor. Six well-cut slabs clustered about a seventh, six-sided stone. He drove his sword point into a crack and pried carefully. The edge of the central stone tilted slightly upward. A little work, and he lifted it out and leaned it against the curving wall. Straining his eyes downward, he saw only the gaping blackness of a dark well with small, worn steps that led downward and out of sight. He did not hesitate. Though the skin between his shoulders crawled curiously, he swung himself into the abyss and felt the clinging blackness swallow him. Groping downward, he felt his feet slip and stumble on steps, too small for human feet. With one hand, pressed hard against the side of the well, he steadied himself, fearing a fall into unknown and unlighted depths. The steps were cut into solid rock, yet they were greatly worn away. The farther he progressed, the less like steps they became, mere bumps of worn stone. Then the direction of the shaft changed sharply. It still led down, but at a shallow slant down which he could walk, elbows braced against the hollowed sides, head bent low beneath the curved roof. The steps had ceased altogether, and the stone felt slimy to the touch like a serpent's lair. What beings, Bran wondered, had slithered up and down this slanting shaft for how many centuries? The tunnel narrowed, until Bran found it rather difficult to shove through. He lay on his back and pushed himself along with his hands, feet first. Still he knew he was sinking deeper and deeper into the very guts of the earth. How far below the surface he was, he dared not contemplate. Then ahead a faint witch-fire gleam tinged the abysmal blackness. He grinned savagely and without mirth. If they, he sought, came suddenly upon him, how could he fight in that narrow shaft? But he had put the thought of personal fear behind him when he began this hellish quest. He crawled on, thoughtless of all else but his goal. And he came at last into a vast space where he could stand upright. He could not see the roof of the place, but he got an impression of dizzying vastness. The blackness pressed in on all sides and behind him he could see the entrance to the shaft, from which he had just emerged. A black well in the darkness. But in front of him, a strange grisly radiance glowed about a grim altar, built of human skulls. The source of that light he could not determine, but on the altar lay a sullen night-black object. The black stone. Bran wasted no time in giving thanks that the guardians of the grim relic were nowhere near. He caught up the stone, and gripping it under his left arm, crawled into the shaft. When a man turns his back on peril, its clammy menace looms more grisly than when he advances upon it. So Bran, crawling back up the knighted shaft with his grisly prize, felt the darkness turn on him and slink behind him, grinning with dripping fangs. Clammy sweat beaded his flesh, and he hastened to the best of his ability, ears strained for some stealthy sound, to betray that fell shapes were at his heels. Strong shudders shook him, despite himself, and the short hair on his neck prickled as if a cold wind blew at his back. When he reached the first of the tiny steps, he felt as if he had attained to the outer boundaries of the mortal world. Up them he went, stumbling and slipping, and with a deep gasp of relief, came out into the tomb, whose spectral greyness seemed like the blaze of noon in comparison to the Stygian depths he had just traversed. He replaced the central stone and strode into the light of the outer day, and never was the cold yellow light of the sun more grateful, as it dispelled the shadows of black-winged nightmares of fear and madness that seemed to have ridden him up out of the black deeps. He shoved the great blocking stone back into place, and picking up the cloak he had left at the mouth of the tomb, he wrapped it about the black stone and hurried away, a strong revulsion and loathing shaking his soul and lending wings to his strides. A grey silence brooded over the land. It was desolate as the blind side of the moon, yet Bran felt the potentialities of life. Under his feet, in the brown earth, sleeping, but how soon to waken, and in what horrific fashion. 
He came through the tall masking reeds to the still deep men called Dagon's Mere. No slightest ripple ruffled the cold blue water to give evidence of the grisly monster legend said dwelt beneath. Bran closely scanned the breathless landscape. He saw no hint of life, human or unhuman. He sought the instincts of his savage soul to know if any unseen eyes fixed their lethal gaze upon him and found no response. He was alone as if he were the last man alive on earth. Swiftly, he unwrapped the black stone, and as it lay in his hands like a solid sullen block of darkness, he did not seek to learn the secret of its material, nor scan the cryptic characters carved thereon. Weighing it in his hands and calculating the distance, he flung it far out, so that it fell almost exactly in the middle of the lake. A sullen splash and the waters closed over it. There was a moment of shimmering flashes on the bosom of the lake. Then the blue surface stretched placid and unrippled again. The woman turned swiftly as Bran approached her door. Her slant eyes widened. You, and alive, and sane. I have been into hell and I have returned, he growled. What is more, I have that which I sought. The black stone, she cried. You really dared steal it. Where is it? No matter. But last night, my stallion screamed in his stall, and I heard something crunch beneath his thundering hoofs, which was not the wall of the stable, and there was blood on his hoofs when I came to see, and blood on the floor of the stall, and I have heard stealthy sounds in the night, and noises beneath my dirt floor, as if worms burrowed deep in the earth. They know I have stolen their stone. Have you betrayed me? She shook her head. I keep your secret. They do not need my word to know you. The farther they have retreated from the world of men, the greater have grown their powers in other uncanny ways. Some dawn, your hut will stand empty, and if men dare investigate, they will find nothing except crumbling bits of earth on the dirt floor. Bran smiled terribly. I have not planned and toiled thus far to fall prey to the talons of vermin. If they strike me down in the night, they will never know what became of their idol, or whatever it be to them. I would speak with them. Dare you come with me and meet them in the night? She asked. Thunder of all gods, he snarled. Who are you to ask me if I dare? Lead me to them and let me bargain for a vengeance this night. The hour of retribution draws nigh. This day, I saw silvered helmets and bright shields gleam across the fens. The new commander has arrived at the Tower of Trajan and Caius Camillus has marched to the wall. That night, the king went across the dark desolation of the moors with a silent were woman. The night was thick and still, as if the land lay in ancient slumber. The stars blinked vaguely, mere points of red, struggling through the unbreathing gloom. Their gleam was dimmer than the glitter in the eyes of the woman who glided beside the king. Strange thoughts shook Bran, vague, titanic, primeval. Tonight, ancestral linkings with these slumbering fens stirred in his soul and troubled him with the phantasmal eon-veiled shapes of monstrous dreams. The vast age of his race was born upon him, where now he walked an outlaw and an alien, dark-eyed kings in whose mould he was cast had reigned in old times. The Celtic and Roman invaders were as strangers to this ancient isle beside his people. Yet his race likewise had been invaders, and there was an older race than his. A race whose beginnings lay lost and hidden back beyond the dark oblivion of antiquity. Ahead of them loomed a low range of hills which formed the easternmost extremity of those straying chains, which far away climbed at last to the mountains of Wales. The woman led the way up what might have been a sheep path and halted before a wide black gaping cave. A door to those you seek, O King! Her laughter rang hateful in the gloom. Dare ye enter? His fingers closed in her tangled locks and he shook her viciously. Ask me but once more if I dare, he grated, and your head and shoulders part company, lead on. Her laughter was like sweet, deadly venom. They passed into the cave, and Bran struck flint and steel. The flicker of the tinder showed him a wide, dusty cavern, on the roof of which hung clusters of bats. Lighting a torch, he lifted it and scanned the shadowy recesses, seeing nothing but dust and emptiness. Where are they? he growled. She beckoned him to the back of the cave and leaned against the rough wall as if casually. But the king's keen eyes caught the motion of her hand pressing hard against a projecting ledge. 
He recoiled as a round black well gaped suddenly at his feet. Again her laughter slashed him like a keen silver knife. He held the torch to the opening and again saw small worn steps leading down. They do not need those steps, said Apla. Once they did, before your people drove them into the darkness. But you will need them. She thrust the torch into a niche above the well. It shed a faint red light into the darkness below. She gestured into the well and Bran loosened his sword and stepped into the shaft. As he went down into the mystery of the darkness, the light was blotted out above him, and he thought for an instant Atla had covered the opening again. Then he realized that she was descending after him. The descent was not a long one. Abruptly, Bran felt his feet on a solid floor. Atla swung down beside him and stood in the dim circle of light that drifted down the shaft. Bran could not see the limits of the place into which he had come. Many caves in these hills, said Atla, her voice sounding small and strangely brittle in the vastness, are but doors to greater caves which lie beneath, even as a man's words and deeds are, but small indications of the dark caverns of murky thought lying behind and beneath. And now Bran was aware of movement in the gloom. The darkness was filled with stealthy noises, not like those made by any human foot. Abruptly, sparks began to flash and float in the blackness like flickering fireflies. Closer they came until they girdled him in a wide half-moon. And beyond the ring gleamed other sparks, a solid sea of them, fading away in the gloom until the farthest were mere tiny pinpoints of light. And Bran knew they were the slanted eyes of the beings who had come upon him in such numbers that his brain reeled at the contemplation and at the vastness of the cavern. Now that he faced his ancient foes, Bran knew no fear. He felt the waves of terrible menace emanating from them, the grisly hate, the inhuman threat to body, mind and soul. More than a member of a less ancient race, he realized the horror of his position, but he did not fear, though he confronted the ultimate horror of the dreams and legends of his race. His blood raced fiercely, but it was with the hot excitement of the hazard, not the drive of terror. They know you have the stone, O King, said Atla, and though he knew she feared, though he felt her physical efforts to control her trembling limbs, there was no quiver of fright in her voice. You are in deadly peril, they know your breed of old. Oh, they remember the days when their ancestors were men. I cannot save you, both of us will die, as no human has died for ten centuries. Speak to them, if you will. They can understand your speech, though you may not understand theirs. But it will avail not. You are human and a Pict. Bran laughed, and the closing ring of fire shrank back at the savagery in his laughter. Drawing his sword with a soul-chilling rasp of steel, he set his back against what he hoped was a solid stone wall. Facing the glittering eyes, with his sword gripped in his right hand and his dirk in his left, he laughed as a blood-hungry wolf snarls. Aye, he growled, I am a Pict, a son of those warriors who drove your brutish ancestors before them, like chaff before the storm, who flooded the land with your blood and heaped high your skulls for a sacrifice to the moon woman. You, who fled of old before my race, dare ye now snarl at your master? Roll on me like a flood now, if ye dare. Before your viper fangs drink my life, I will reap your multitudes like ripened barley. Of your severed heads will I build a tower, and of your mangled corpses will I rear up a wall. Dogs of the dark, vermin of hell, worms of the earth, rush in and try my steel. When death finds me in this dark cavern, your living will howl for the scores of your dead, and your black stone will be lost to you forever. For only I know where it is hidden, and not all the torches of all the hells can wring the secret from my lips. Then followed a tense silence. Bran faced the fire-lit darkness, tensed like a wolf at bay, waiting the charge. At his side, the woman cowered her eyes ablaze. Then, from the silent ring that hovered beyond the dim torchlight, rose a vague, abhorrent murmur. Bran, prepared as he was for anything, started. God's was that the speech of creatures which had once been called men. Atna straightened, listening intently. From her lips came the same hideous, soft sibilances, and Bran, though he had already known the grisly secret of her being, knew that never again could he touch her save with soul-shaken loathing. She turned to him, a strange smile curving her red lips, dimly in the ghostly light. They fear you, O King. 
by the black secrets of our lie, who are you that hell itself quails before you? Not your steel, but the stark ferocity of your soul has driven unused fear into their strange minds. They will buy back the black stone at any price. Good, Bran sheathed his weapons. They shall promise not to molest you because of your aid of me. And his voice hummed like the purr of a hunting tiger. They shall deliver into my hands Titus Sula, governor of Eberacum, now commanding the Tower of Trajan. This they can do, how, I know not. But I know that in the old days, when my people warred with these children of the night, babes disappeared from guarded huts, and none saw the stealers come or go. Do they understand? Again rose the low frightful sounds and Bran, who feared not their wrath, shuddered at their voices. They understand, said Atla. Bring the black stone to Dagon's ring tomorrow night, when the earth is veiled, with the blackness that forums the dawn, lay the stone on the altar. There they will bring Tita Sula to you. Trust them, they have not interfered in human affairs for many centuries, but they will keep their word. Bran nodded and turning, climbed up the stair with Adler close behind him. At the top he turned and looked down once more. As far as he could see, floated a glittering ocean of slanted yellow eyes upturned, but the owners of those eyes kept carefully beyond the dim circle of torchlight, and of their bodies he could see nothing. Their low hissing speech floated up to him and he shuddered, as his imagination visualised not a throng of biped creatures, but a swarming, swaying myriad of serpents gazing up at him with their glittering, unwinking eyes. He swung into the upper cave, and Atla thrust the blocking stone back in place. It fitted into the entrance of the well with uncanny precision. Bran was unable to discern any crack in the apparently solid floor of the cavern. Atla made a motion to extinguish the torch, but the king stayed her. Keep it so, until we are out of the cave, he grunted. We might tread on an adder in the dark. Atla's sweetly hateful laughter rose maddeningly in the flickering gloom. It was not long before sunset when Bran came again to the reed-grown marge of Dagon's Mere. Casting cloak and sword belt on the ground, he stripped himself of his short leathern breeches. Then gripping his naked dirk in his teeth, he went into the water with the smooth ease of a diving seal. Swimming strongly, he gained the centre of the small lake and turning, drove himself downward. The Mere was deeper than he had thought. It seemed he would never reach the bottom, and when he did, his groping hands failed to find what he sought. A roaring in his ears warned him and he swam to the surface. Gulping deep of the refreshing air, he dived again, and again his quest was fruitless. A third time, he sought the depth, and this time his groping hands met a familiar object in the silt of the bottom. Grasping it, he swam up to the surface. The stone was not particularly bulky, but it was heavy. He swam leisurely and suddenly, was aware of a curious stir in the waters about him, which was not caused by his own exertions. Thrusting his face below the surface, he tried to pierce the blue depths with his eyes and thought to see a dim, gigantic shadow hovering there. He swam faster, not frightened, but wary. His feet struck the shallows and he waded up on the shelving shore. Looking back, he saw the waters swirl and subside. He shook his head, swearing. He had discounted the ancient legend, which made Dagon's mere the lair of a nameless water monster, but now he had a feeling as if his escape had been narrow. The time-worn myths of the ancient land were taking form and coming to life before his eyes. What primeval shape lurked below the surface of that treacherous mere, Bran could not guess, but he felt that the Fenman had good reason for shunning the spot, after all. Bran donned his garments mounted the black stallion and rode across the fens, in the desolate crimson of the sunset's afterglow, with the black stone wrapped in his cloak. He rode, not to his hut, but to the west, in the direction of the Tower of Trajan and the Ring of Dagon. As he covered the miles that lay between, the red stars winked out. Midnight passed him in the moonless night, and still Bran rode on. His heart was hot, for his meeting with Titus Sula. Adler had gloated over the anticipation of watching the Roman writhe under torture, but no such thought was in the Pict's mind. The governor should have his chance with weapons. With Bran's own sword, he should face the Pictish king's dirk 
and live or die according to his prowess. And though Sula was famed throughout the provinces as a swordsman, Bran felt no doubt as to the outcome. Dagon's ring lay some distance from the tower, a sullen circle of tall gaunt stones planted upright, with a rough-hewn stone altar in the centre. The Romans looked on these men here with aversion. They thought the Druids had reared them, but the Celts supposed Bran's people, the Picts, had planted them. And Bran well knew what hands reared those grim monoliths in lost ages, though for what reasons he but dimly guessed. The king did not ride straight to the ring. He was consumed with curiosity as to how his grim allies intended carrying out their promise. That they could snatch Titus Sula from the very midst of his men, he felt sure, and he believed he knew how they would do it. He felt the gnawings of a strange misgiving, as if he had tampered with powers of unknown breadth and depth, and had loosed forces which he could not control. Each time, he remembered that reptilian murmur, those slanted eyes of the night before, a cold breath passed over him. They had been abhorrent enough when his people drove them into the caverns under the hills ages ago. What had long centuries of retrogression made of them? In their knighted, subterranean life, had they retained any of the attributes of humanity at all? Some instinct prompted him to ride toward the tower. He knew he was near, but for the thick darkness he could have plainly seen, its stark outline tusking the horizon. Even now, he should be able to make it out dimly. An obscure, shuddersome premonition shook him and he spurred the stallion into swift canter. And suddenly, Bran staggered in his saddle as from a physical impact, so stunning was the surprise of what met his gaze. The impregnable Tower of Trajan was no more. Bran's astounded gaze rested on a gigantic pile of ruins of shattered stone and crumbled granite, from which jutted the jagged and splintered ends of broken beams. At one corner of the tumbled heap, one tower rose out of the waste of crumpled masonry, and it leaned drunkenly, as if its foundations had been half cut away. Bran dismounted and walked forward, dazed by bewilderment. The moat was filled in places by fallen stones and broken pieces of mortared wall. He crossed over and came among the ruins, where, he knew, only a few hours before, the flags had resounded to the martial tramp of iron-clad feet and the walls had echoed to the clang of shields and the blast of the loud-throated trumpets. A horrific silence reigned. Almost under Bran's feet, a broken shape writhed and groaned. The king bent down to the legionary who lay in a sticky red pool of his own blood. A single glance showed the Pict that the man, horribly crushed and shattered, was dying. Lifting the bloody head, Bran placed his flask to the pulped lips and the Roman instinctively drank deep gulping through splintered teeth. In the dim starlight, Bran saw his glazed eyes roll. The walls fell, muttered the dying man. They crashed down, like the skies falling on the day of doom. Our Jove, the skies rained shards of granite and hailstones of marble. I have felt no earthquake shock, Bran scowled, puzzled. It was no earthquake, muttered the Roman. Before last dawn it began, the faint, dim scratching and clawing far below the earth. We of the guard heard it, like rats burrowing, or like worms hollowing out the earth. Titus laughed at us, but all day long we heard it. Then at midnight, the tower quivered and seemed to settle, as if the foundations were being dug away. A shudder shook Bran MacMorn. The worms of the earth, thousands of vermin digging like moles, far below the castle, burrowing away the foundations, gods. The land must be honeycombed with tunnels and caverns. These creatures were even less human than he had thought. What ghastly shapes of darkness had he invoked to his aid? What of Titus Sula? he asked, again holding the flask to the legionary's lips. In that moment, the dying Roman seemed to him almost like a brother. Even as the tower shuddered, we heard a fearful scream from the governor's chamber, muttered the soldier. We rushed there, as we broke down the door, we heard his shrieks. They seemed to recede into the bowels of the earth. We rushed in. The chamber was empty. His blood-stained sword lay on the floor. In the stone flags of the floor, a black hole gaped. Then, the towers reeled. The roof broke through a storm of crashing walls crawled. A strong convulsion shook the broken figure. 
Lay me down, friend, whispered the Roman. I die. He had ceased to breathe before Bran could comply. The Pict rose, mechanically cleansing his hands. He hastened from the spot, and as he galloped over the darkened fens, the weight of the accursed black stone under his cloak was as the weight of a foul nightmare on a mortal breast. As he approached the ring, he saw an eerie glow within, so that the gaunt stone stood etched like the ribs of a skeleton in which a witch fire burns. The stallion snorted and reared as Bran tied him to one of the men here. Carrying the stone, he strode into the grisly circle and saw Atlas standing beside the altar, one hand on her hip, her sinuous body swaying in a serpentine manner. The altar glowed all over with ghastly light, and Bran knew someone, probably Atla, had rubbed it with phosphorus from some dank swamp or quagmire. He strode forward and whipping his cloak from about the stone, flung the accursed thing on to the altar. I have fulfilled my part of the contract, he growled. And they, there's, she retorted. Look, they come. He wheeled, his hand instinctively dropping to his sword. Outside the ring, the great stallion screamed savagely and reared against his tether. The night wind moaned through the waving grass and an abhorrent soft hissing mingled with it. Between the menhirs flowed a dark tide of shadows, unstable and chaotic. The ring filled with glittering eyes, which hovered beyond the dim, elusive circle of illumination cast by the phosphorescent altar. Somewhere in the darkness, a human voice tittered and gibbered idiotically. Bran stiffened, the shadows of a horror clawing at his soul. He strained his eyes, trying to make out the shapes of those who ringed him. But he glimpsed only billowing masses of shadow, which heaved and writhed and squirmed with almost fluid consistency. Let them make good their bargain, he exclaimed angrily. Then see, O oh king, cried Atla in a voice of piercing mockery. There was a stir, a seething in the writhing shadows, and from the darkness crept, like a four-legged animal, a human shape that fell down and groveled at Bran's feet and writhed and mowed, and lifting a death's head, howled like a dying dog. In the ghastly light, Bran, soul shaken, saw the blank, glassy eyes, the bloodless features, the loose, writhing, froth-covered lips of sheer lunacy. Gods, was this Titus Sula, the proud lord of life and death in Eberacham's proud city? Bran bared his sword. I had thought to give this stroke in vengeance, he said somberly. I give it in mercy. Vale Caesar. The steel flashed in the eerie light and Sula's head rolled to the foot of the glowing altar, where it lay staring up at the shadowed sky. They harmed him not. Atla's hateful laugh slashed the sick silence. It was what he saw and came to know that broke his brain. Like all his heavy-footed race, he knew nothing of the secrets of this ancient land. This night, he has been dragged through the deepest pits of hell, where even you might have blenched. Well for the Romans, that they know not the secrets of this accursed land, Bran roared, maddened, with its monster-haunted mirrors, its foul witch-women, and its lost caverns and subterranean realms, where spawn in the darkness shapes of hell. Are they more foul than a mortal who seeks their aid? cried Atla with a shriek of fearful mirth. Give them their black stone. A cataclysmic loathing shook Bran's soul with red fury. Aye, take your cursed stone, he roared snatching it from the altar and dashing it among the shadows with such savagery that bones snapped under its impact. A hurried babel of grisly tongues rose and the shadows heaved in turmoil. One segment of the mass detached itself for an instant and Bran cried out in fierce revulsion, though he caught only a fleeting glimpse of the thing, had only a brief impression of a broad, strangely flattened head, pendulous writhing lips that bared curved pointed fangs and a hideously misshapen, dwarfish body that seemed mottled, all set off by those unwinking reptilian eyes. Gods. The myths had prepared him for horror in human aspect. Horror induced by bestial visage and stunted deformity. But this was the horror of nightmare and the night. Go back to hell and take your idol with you, he yelled, brandishing his clenched fists to the skies, as the thick shadows receded, flowing back and away from him like the foul waters of some black flood. Your ancestors were men, though strange and monstrous. But gods, ye have become in ghastly fact what my people called ye in scorn. Worms of the earth, back into your holes and burrows, 
ye foul the air, and leave on the clean earth the slime of the serpents ye have become. Gunnar was right. There are shapes too foul to use, even against Rome. He sprang from the ring, as a man flees the touch of a coiling snake, and tore the stallion free. At his elbow, Atla was shrieking with fearful laughter. All human attributes dropped from her like a cloak in the night. King of Pictland, she cried, King of Fools, do you blench at so small a thing? Stay and let me show you, real fruits of the pit. Ha ha ha, run, fool, run, but you are stained with the taint. You have called them forth, and they will remember, and in their own time, they will come to you again. He yelled a wordless curse, and struck her savagely in the mouth with his open hand. She staggered, blood starting from her lips, but her fiendish laughter only rose higher. Bran leaped into the saddle, wild for the clean heather and the cold blue hills of the north, where he could plunge his sword into clean slaughter, and his sickened soul into the red maelstrom of battle, and forget the horror which lurked below the fens of the west. He gave the frantic stallion the rein, and rode through the night like a hunted ghost, until the hellish laughter of the howling were woman, died out in the darkness behind. Thank you for joining us in the shadowed depths of worms of the earth. As we leave behind the eerie tales of vengeance and ancient powers, remember, revenge can consume even the mightiest of hearts. If this tale of dark legacies and timeless retribution has captivated you, help us reach 100 likes. Once we do, we'll unlock the secrets of Kings of the Night, the first story about our enigmatic Pictish king. Until next time, may your battles be brave and your spirits unbroken.